chapter 6, and I'm reading and preaching on 1 to 6. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this a carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief and went about among the villages teaching. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would be with my mouth this morning, be with the hearts of everyone. Help us to hear your word for the grass with us and the flowers Fade by the word of the Lord and yours forever. Amen. 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 Please be seated. <laughs> Human rejection and betrayal due to suffering, these things are widespread in the scriptures. Of course, we know the story of Job, as well as numerous examples in the Psalms where there is rejection and betrayal. We also know of the rejection that comes from enemies. That one is rather obvious. Our enemies hate us and therefore they reject us. All right? If they didn't, they wouldn't be our enemies. The job description of an enemy is to hate and reject. We also know the rejection that comes from God. This is usually due to sin and a lack of repentance. Again, the Psalms give us many examples of these things. We can also think of God's rejection of his leaders. Uh, Think about Saul, right, who was rejected by God. But there is another kind of rejection that we sometimes encounter in the scriptures, and it is rather peculiar. It is a rejection by friends and family when they deem a person too ordinary to offer them counsel or rebuke. It is a dangerous form of unbelief which can lead to all kinds of evil, even murder. Now consider Genesis 37, which Mr. Oldland read, and the speech of Joseph's brothers. They said to themselves, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him in one of those pits. Now, why did they come up with such an evil plan? Now, we learned earlier on in that story that they were jealous of Joseph, their brother, because he was his father's beloved son. And he kept telling them about these dreams that he was having, all right, that he was going to rule over them. But the main reason they hated him was because they knew him all too well as their brother. They knew him all too well as their brother. And they could not stand the idea that their younger brother was going to be exalted over them. They hated him because of his dreams, even though his dreams were from God. You've heard the expression, familiarity breeds contempt. That expression captures a truth that we tend to reject or hate the counsel of those we know all too well. And so spouses reject each other's counsel, but then listen to the counsel offered by someone else. Children reject the counsel of their parents, but then will submit to the counsel of a friend or someone in some other place. Church members reject the counsel of those who rule over them, but look for counsel for someone in some remote place. What is it about us? What is it about that human, our human condition that makes us want to keep looking anywhere but to those closest to us for counsel, encouragement, and even rebuke? The short answer is that there is sin in us. Sin blinds us from seeing that God delights to use ordinary means to accomplish extraordinary results. This was a problem with the Jews and the Greeks, always searching, always looking for impressive agents. They were all about the outward appearance. In his letter to the Corinthians, you remember Paul said that the Jews seek signs and Greeks seek wisdom. 
But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. It's an age-old problem that we tend to despise things that we are too familiar with. And we know that Jesus was finally rejected and killed by the Jews because of his claims to be Messiah. But that's only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin was that he was rejected for his ordinariness. All right, Isaiah says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Yes, Jesus was on the outward, outwardly unimpressive, an outwardly unimpressive Jewish man who ministered to people in a climate of unbelief. Now let's try and understand the flow of Mark's narrative here before we get into our text proper. After taking us through three back-to-back -back episodes that display Jesus' unique authority to subdue all things, remember creation, uh, demons, and even death, Mark now turns to the theme of the gospel on the move. But what is implied in these next few episodes is the idea that when the gospel moves, uh, what happens is that it is rejected. It is met with opposition, and sometimes even death. Here in chapter 6, Mark gives us those three back-to-back -back themes of rejection. First, you have the rejection of Christ, who is the word of God. Second, you have the potential rejection of the word delivered by Jesus' apostles. And third, you have the rejection of truth by Herod, who kills God's messenger, John the Baptist. What these three episodes expose is the inherent nature of man to reject the truth of God's word and even hate those who present it. Now, put it in another way, some reject God's word because it's too familiar. That's verse 1 to 6. Others reject his word because they simply disagree with it. That's verse 11. And yet some reject God's word because it exposes their sin. Verse 14 to 29. So today we're only going to look at the first episode. All right, Jesus' rejection at Nazareth. And I want us to look at that episode under two broad headings. All right, two broad headings. One, amazing unbelief. This is verse 1 to 3. An amazing unbelief. And then two, the consequences of such unbelief. This is verse 4 to 6. So let's start off with amazing unbelief. We learn in verse 1 that Jesus had moved away from Capernaum. Remember that Capernaum is where his ministry has been largely concentrated since chapter 1. Where he moved from Nazareth, went to Capernaum by the sea, and he has been ministering there. All right, he's come to his hometown, which is Nazareth, with his disciples. Remember, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but Nazareth of Galilee is where he grew up. Nazareth was a village 25 miles southeast of Capernaum, the Sea of Capernaum. Uh, it wasn't a very remarkable place, uh, as historians report. Uh, it is not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. And outside of the few mentions in the Gospels, we know nothing significant about that place. You remember Nathaniel's famous remark in the Gospel of John. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That remark reveals a common sentiment, a Jewish sentiment of that day, that fellow Galileans ridiculed that place because it was just unimpressive. It was an obscure agricultural village with, um, I read that the total population would not exceed 500 people. But significantly, this city of ridicule became associated with Jesus. He is referred to as Jesus of Nazareth several times in the Gospels. Jesus has spent almost 30 years of his life growing up in Nazareth. So he probably knew many people there, right? So on the occasion of his homecoming, you expect that everyone was excited to see him, throwing a big party for him to welcome him, right? His fame has increased, he left Nazareth alone, but here he's coming as this rabbi with his disciples following him. But we learn from verse 2 that when the Sabbath came, we learn from verse 2 that when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. You know, one thing that we can observe about Jesus and his life is that he was perfectly obedient to God in everything. All right, he didn't take shortcuts because he was God but he fulfilled all obedience perfectly by keeping all of God's laws. That included regular synagogue attendance, as you are seeing here. 
he was in synagogue every Saturday, every Sabbath day. All right? He included regular prayers. He did all things well. You know, his death on the cross is important to us for our salvation. But equally important is the life that he lived for us. All right? Without the life of perfect obedience, Jesus would have no righteousness to impute to you and I. All right? So that is very important. On this occasion, he went to, to the synagogue as a visiting rabbi to teach. Uh, Jewish synagogues, again, uh, I stated this before in an earlier sermon, but I can restate it. Uh, Jewish synagogues in, in those days were assembly houses uh, where the people gathered every Saturday to read and expound on the law and the prophets. Uh, it wasn't a replacement for the temple. The only temple was in Jerusalem. But these synagogues were like these assembly houses and the synagogue ruler would organize for visiting rabbis to come and teach. And so on this occasion, Jesus was that invited rabbi. Now let's look at the reaction of the audience. Mark doesn't give us the content of Jesus' teaching, which I find a bit curious. But he tells us the audience's reaction. They were astonished. The Greek word Mark uses for astonished occurs frequently in the Gospels to describe how people reacted to Jesus' teachings and his miracles. He frequently led, uh, left people amazed by the power and authority which really spoke and performed his miracles. And his teaching was qualitatively different from that of the rabbis of his day. Jesus would not preach using footnotes. Uh, he wouldn't say, as Rabbi Gamaliel has said, uh, he wouldn't refer to any of those people. He spoke convincingly from the scriptures, appealing to no one but God. He taught as one who had authority and not as their scribes, Mark 1.22. He said in John 12, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. So we have to understand that every word that came from Jesus' mouth was the word of God. All right? There were no casual remarks that, uh, well, don't include this in the text. Everything he spoke was exactly what God wanted him to say. Everyone who heard Jesus preach was left amazed. Uh, for he stood in a category by himself. And you know, I don't think we can truly grasp how different Jesus' teaching and preaching was from his contemporaries. Uh, we get a small glimpse of that in Luke's account, where after reading the scroll of Isaiah, uh, Jesus gives the shortest exposition ever. All right? Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. I wish I could do that. I'll be done with my sermon in a minute. Right? But Jesus is the only one who could say things like that, right? All right. On the Sermon on the Mount, he all, we also see where he used the formula, you have heard it said, but I say to you, I say to you. I mean, who can speak like that? All of the scriptures are about him, so when he was preaching about him, when he was preaching, he was preaching about himself. But it wasn't as though whenever he preached, he always said, look at me, I'm the fulfillment, Right? He rightly explained the text with great clarity and truth that was undeniable, and the Spirit of God was always at work in him. So on this occasion, the crowd was in awe, as they should be. You and I should be in awe every time we hear the scriptures read out loud, right? They were in awe in hearing a man speak with the authority of God, but they did not allow their astonishment to carry them to faith. Rather, they were astonished that those wise words were coming out of the mouth of Jesus. This Jesus whom they knew so well, the one who had lived before their very eyes for three decades, eating, drinking, and dressing like everyone else in Nazareth. Not Jesus. Right? How could this man be saying these things? How could he be our teacher? We saw him grow up before us. Their astonishment quickly turned to unbelief. Mark lists a series of rhetorical questions showing us what was really going on behind the scenes. Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not the sisters here with us? Now let's observe a few things about these questions. The first thing we notice is that they questioned the source of his teaching. Jesus had no rabbinical training from their religious establishment. He didn't attend any of their schools. He didn't belong to any of their parties. 
right? He was taught by God. But this offended the audience because they would have rather welcomed someone with credentials, uh, perhaps a PhD in Torah interpretation, right? They wanted a decorated scholar, but they failed to see that the man who spoke with such great authority was God incarnate. So they did not give him honor because of his ordinary appearance and humble background. Another question they asked was, is this not the carpenter? What were they driving at? Now there's a small difference that I must point out between Mark's report and that of Matthew. Mark says, is this not the carpenter? Matthew says, carpenter's son. Now that's fairly easy to resolve, right? Once you understand that it was a common expectation that the father would teach his son a manual trade. All right, so Joseph was a carpenter and Jesus grew up working as a carpenter. Now the word used for carpenter in the Greek is tekton, means one who builds. It can be used for a person who makes things out of wood, stone, or other materials. It's the same word from which we get our English word architect. All right, but so more than likely, Jesus worked in stone and other materials and not just wood. All right, so he was, the word really means somebody who built, it's a builder. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean that he was, his um, trade was relegated to working in wood. In any case, being a carpenter or builder was not an insult in itself. But what the people are driving at is the idea that Jesus was a menial laborer like many of them were. Therefore, he could not be their teacher. You are just like one of us. How can you teach us? The second part, the son of Mary, that one is ridicule. All right, we learn from John 8 that some of the Jews considered him to be an illegitimate child. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. Now, you know, that's slander. These people were denying the virgin birth. Now, Joseph is not mentioned in this text, and some commentators speculate that he probably was dead. We don't know for sure. In any case, it was more common for sons to be referred to by their father, father's names, rather than their mothers. This would be true even if Joseph was dead. So they shouldn't really be saying, is that not, the, is that not Mary's son, right? But they are ridiculing him. That's why they are saying that. And they go on to name his siblings, James, Joseph, Judas, Simon, and also make mention of his sisters. Why did they do that? It was to make the same point that an ordinary person could not be their teacher. They knew him all too well, they thought. Now, by the way, this note of Jesus' siblings completely shatters this idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary, right? Uh, obviously, uh, these are Jesus' half-brothers and sisters. These were siblings born to Mary and Joseph after Jesus was born. All right? So Mary did not remain a virgin forever. Okay? Uh, John 7, 5 says that even his brothers believed in him. Not even his brothers believed in him. All right? They didn't believe in him during his earthly ministry. We saw an earlier indication of that in chapter 3 where his family wanted to arrest him because they thought he was out of his mind. So this remark by the people of Nazareth was an attempt to discredit his ministry entirely. Now listen, you can be so close to Jesus and still not know him as Lord. It takes spiritual eyes given by God to remove that blindness. And by the grace of God, we learn in Acts that James, his brother, became a prominent leader in the church Judas is Jude, who wrote the epistle by that name in our New Testament. Uh, we don't know anything about Joseph and Simon. In summary, the audience at that synagogue did not believe in Jesus because they questioned the source of his teaching and power. They hated the very fact that an ordinary man who had grown up before them could be the Messiah. For 30 years, they had witnessed his blameless and perfect obedience to his parents. Now, I hope we, we, we remember that because it wasn't as though Jesus, at the age of 30, suddenly had this epiphany that he was God. That wasn't what happened. So he grew up before them as God, as a son of God. He grew up in perfect obedience. He was the most obedient child that ever lived. And he grew up before them fulfilling all things perfectly. So they had the evidence that he was indeed who he said he was. All right? 
So they, they still didn't believe, that's quite all that evidence. They questioned all his power, they questioned his teaching. All right, but that is really a very, very sad situation. These comments that they make about him are very skeptical, derogatory, and I'll say borderline blasphemous, if you think about it. Now Mark is doing something interesting here that I want us to take notice of. Look down at the end of verse three for a minute. He says that the people took offense at him, but he doesn't give us the content of Jesus' teaching. All right, this means that he wants us to see that the connection between their astonishment and their taking offense was not primarily based on what Jesus said. It was really a thing about his personality. All right, it was the fact that it was him, Jesus, the carpenter, who was saying it. Maybe Rabbi Gamaliel could have said the same things and they would have appreciated it. But the fact that it was Jesus, they hated it. The word that Mark uses for offense here is scandalon in the Greek, scandalon. It means a stumbling block. In our context, it means that people were put off by Jesus. Now, simply put, they hated him, right? The Christ who was to be their salvation had become their stumbling block. A very sad situation. Now think with me for a second. How is it that you can move so easily from astonishment to offense? How do you move so easily from astonishment to offense? What is it in the human heart that makes such a transition not only likely but so easy? Now, I think many sinful conditions can serve as a catalyst to move us from astonishment to offense. Jealousy can do that. Pride, complacency, and many such things can do that. Sin has so infected our hearts that it's possible to be amazed by God's truth and even to be convicted by his truth and still reject it because of the one telling it. The religious leaders of John 9, for instance, they were convicted by the truth spoken by the man born blind. Remember that episode? Jesus heals this man born blind. The man goes to the religious leaders to show himself to them. And then the people are doing this back and forth. And eventually, uh, the man tells him, uh, the, the, the man gives this really wonderful sermonette to the Jewish leaders about how, whether Jesus is a sinner or not, he does not know, but all he knows is that his eyes are open. And the leaders are offended by him. They're like, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? You were convicted by the truth. But they rejected it because of the man telling them that. These people at Nazareth had heard of Jesus' miracles. Perhaps they had even seen him heal some people when he arrived. He had heard of his fame in Judea, in Capernaum, and in other regions. I don't miss the point here. Mark has followed up some of the most mighty acts of Jesus with this sad event. From the end of chapter 4 all the way to the end of chapter 5, we've seen powerful sign after powerful sign after powerful sign. The calming of the storm, the healing of the demoniac, all right, the healing of the woman with the issue of blood, the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead. And you'll think that with all these powerful signs, and no doubt news about these signs would have traveled very quickly. Word of mouth is faster than anything that you can imagine, right? With all these signs, you'll think that his own people would have given him a warm welcome, but rather they took offense because he was all too ordinary, and they were offended by his ordinariness. Now, let's look at the second point the consequences of such unbelief, all right? So all these things always, have, it always brings consequences with such behavior and character. It is not something just benign. Jesus doesn't just turn away and say, okay, it didn't work out in Nazareth. Uh, there are consequences. We see that in verse four to six. We see Jesus' response in verse four. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his household. The idea embedded in this proverb is quite, was quite common in Jesus' day. Uh, it's a self-evident truth that people tend to show contempt for a messenger that they know all too well. All right, that's a self-evident truth. Remember Jeremiah? I love Jeremiah, Mr. Weeping Prophet, he's called, nickname. He was thrown into a cistern for speaking the truth to his people. Or Isaiah, uh, sent to preach to a people who would not listen. How is that for a job description? Right, go preach to a people who will not hear you. Isaiah was a prophet without honor. 
Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, and many other prophets of old. These were all prophets without honor. But Jesus was the prophet without honor. Even right here in chapter 6, if you look down at verse 15, we see that the people thought him to be a prophet like those of old. He's also identified as a prophet in his conversation with the two men on the road to Emmaus. Jesus is making the point that these people of his hometown, Nazareth, are rejecting him as a prophet of God. They are then no different from the Jews of old who rejected their prophets and even killed some of them. And we can be sure this is a point Jesus is making because he has made it before. One of the interesting things about this text is that this is not the first incident of the rejection of Nazareth. This is the second report or the second occasion of such a rejection. The first one happened earlier on in his ministry about a year ago, all right, a year before this event. That one is recorded in Luke. He said the same thing then. And we see that in Luke 4.24, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. He had made this very statement before, a year before this. But then, when he first made that statement, significantly he pointed them to Elijah and Elisha, prophets of God who their fathers rejected. So God sends them to minister to Gentiles. So Jesus' proverb here is a sobering warning to these people of Nazareth that they had come perilously close to having the light taken away from them. The rejection at Nazareth only anticipates Jesus' final rejection, his betrayal, and his death. John says he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. John 1, 11 to 13. You see, you can stand really close to the gospel. You can know all the verses, know all the hymns, know all the creeds. You can be so exposed to truth, but still show contempt for it. It is not those born by the will of man, but those born by God who receive the gospel. Let's finish up with verse 5 and 6. And he could do no mighty works there, is what we are told, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villagers teaching. Do you see what's happening there in that text? Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. Now, there are only two reports of Jesus marveling in the Gospels, only two occasions. One is in Matthew 8. There he marveled because he found amazing faith in a centurion. The other occasion is here in our text. And he's marveling for the opposite reason, because of the lack of faith. All right, so he marvels once for the presence of faith, and now he's marveling for the lack of faith. Brothers and sisters, I pray that Jesus will marvel at us, but let it never be because of a lack of faith. The people were astonished that a carpenter's son could stand and teach with such authority and do many mighty works. Jesus, on the other hand, is astonished because of their unbelief. That tells us that the circumstances at Nazareth were much more severe than what Jesus had encountered so far in his ministry. All right, it was much more severe. He had seen unbelief in Capernaum and in Judea, but why does unbelief at Nazareth amaze him so much? I think the reason is this. There is greater accountability for those who have been exposed to Christ and rejected. There is greater accountability for those who have been exposed to Christ and rejected. The author of Hebrews warns, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who wants from heaven. The author of Hebrews is calling your attention to consider the wilderness generation. The one who wants on earth, they rejected him, and now we have the one who wants from heaven. They're not rejecting. In the face of overwhelming evidence, they reject their savior. Not because they did not know who he was, but because they knew him all too well. 
Brothers and sisters, we must be on our guard against this danger, this great danger to reject the familiar and the ordinary. You know, I've recently seen a, a trend of ex-Christians um, on the news and social media, uh, people who are just masquerading their own belief and even profiting from it. Uh, there's actually a term for it now. They call it um, ex-evangelicals. Um, a very sad situation. And some prominent uh, men, people that I highly respect, have, have had their children rebel in this way. Um, and these people grew up, uh, that's what's disturbing about it, they grew up in the church. All right? They sang the hymns, they feasted at the Lord's table, and they now have turned their backs on the church because it's all too ordinary. So they are looking for a new thrill. There is really nothing out there. All right? I mean, I just want to warn, uh, for those of you younger ones, the children, there is nothing out there. Take it from me. I wasn't a Christian until 26. Right? There is nothing that you are missing out on. So stay in the faith. Stay in the faith. But there is a glimpse of hope. Mark says that every, every, even with all the unbeliever of Nazareth, Jesus still laid his hands on a few sick people. He showed mercy to a few sick people in that region. Again, we witness the compassion of Christ, who can work his grace even in those circumstances. But the point remains that the people of Nazareth did not witness any of Jesus' mighty works because of their lack of faith. They did not witness it because of their lack of faith. And we don't like to speak this way as reformed people, right? Kind of sounds a little bit charismatic that, you know, this idea that our unbelief can prevent God from actually doing something. It's not something that we like to think about as reformed people. It sounds quite charismatic. Mark is not trying to say that Jesus lacked the ability to do his mighty works. Rather, he could not do his mighty works because he did not want to do his mighty works there. All right, their unbelief has invited the judgment of God. God will not exercise his great power in the midst of such hardened people. So Mark says at the end of verse 6 that he went about among the villages teaching. He took his power elsewhere. All right? This anticipates the next section where he sends his disciples out to preach. In the final analysis, we learn that this amazing unbelief of Nazareth was not due to a lack of evidence. The greatest problem in the world is not that we lack the evidence to believe God. That is not our problem. The greatest problem that we have is the sinfulness of our human hearts. And for that, the only cure is to have eyes, new eyes, and a new heart. But it takes the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to bring that about. Now let's make some use of this text for ourselves. It's easy to hear a sermon like this, breathe a sigh of relief, and pray a prayer saying, I thank you, God, that I have not rejected you, and I'm not like one of those people out there. Those pagan unbelievers who hate Jesus. All right, it's easy to hear a sermon like this for others, but we must hear it for ourselves. We can never be too early or too careful in guarding our hearts against the sin of unbelief. We must watch out for the subtle ways that we reject Christ. So let me give you three subtle ways that's I would exhort you to watch out for. Three subtle ways that we reject Christ. One, we reject Christ when we neglect his commands. All right, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So to neglect his commandments is to hate him. You cannot separate Christ from his word. Right? He is an incarnate word. So if you claim to love Christ, then it must show by your obedience. Two, we reject Christ when we substitute his word for our opinions. The people of Nazareth refused to acknowledge that Jesus' wisdom was from God and that whenever he spoke, he spoke to them as God. They said to him, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? So too at present, we must guard against the spirit of the age that does nothing but question God's word. So instead of submitting to it, we add to it. Or take away from it. We say the Bible has nothing to teach me about sexuality, race, or suffering. Those things are lived experiences. 
I've been reading some books lately, and I came across that term, lived experience. It's, it's a thing right now, right? Certain things are lived experiences. Now, what, what is a lived experience? Uh, it's, it's, it's all this idea that no one can really understand me. The Bible doesn't have anything to say about my situation because I'm the only one who knows what I'm going through. It is a lie. It's a lie, all right? The Bible has everything to say about everything that you are going through, all right? Some will acknowledge that these things are addressed in the Bible, but they boldly declare to be wrong. So brothers and sisters, this too is a rejection of Christ. And then third, we reject Christ when we are complacent. I've grown up in the church, you say. I've read the scriptures over and over. I know everything that is in there. I know the creeds. I've been there, done that. No one can teach me, you say. And so your affections for Christ keep getting cold, but your pride keeps you from receiving healing. Don't trip over Christ. Don't take offense at Christ or his word. Otherwise, he will be offended by you. Pray to him that he will again fan into flame the fires of your heart. Don't think that your situation is irredeemable. Remember, Jesus died so that even those who were offended by him can repent and receive grace and forgiveness. The church is full of many ex-rejectors. Right? There is mercy and grace for those who, are, uh, who have rejected Christ and have repented. And finally, let me give you one exhortation. Treasure the ordinary. Treasure the ordinary. Read your Bibles. Go to church. Pray often. Husbands, listen, listen to your wives and lead them. Wives, listen to your husbands and submit to them. Children, obey your parents and don't think that you are missing out on the world. It's not that complicated, but it takes commitment. Right? It takes commitment. It's ordinary, but it works. This is how God grows us and keeps us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Your word written, your word spoken. Your word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Help us to treasure him and honor him. Father, keep us from the sin of unbelief. All the subtle ways that we choose to reject Christ. I pray that every man, woman, and child in our midst today will cherish your word and not despise it. May we be amazed at Christ always, for he truly is amazing. And may he also be amazed at us, because he has found faith in our midst. We pray this through Christ, who lives and reigns with you forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.